because I've been planting Growers & Co. for like seven years. I just did a lot, so much work to get other people involved and it kind of never worked out, never worked out. And then eventually I just think, no, I, I think I'm going to do it myself. But when people read the magazine, they will understand uh, small scale farming in, in a very positive light because there's a lot of very inspirational growers out there that are doing awesome work. And for me, I just wanted to, to put it out there. Jean-Martin Fortier has been called a rock star farmer, which isn't a title you hear often these days, but one you'll probably be hearing more of in the future, based on the last six months or so. Jean-Martin, along with his wife Maud Hélène Desroches, is the co-founder of Les Jardins de la Crelinette, an internationally recognized 10-acre micro-farm in Quebec, which makes about $100,000 per acre on two acres of cultivated land, with operating margins of about 60%. That's enough to financially sustain his family, and compared to a lot of small-scale farmers, it's a relative fortune. The farm is made up of permanent beds and is completely organic. The focus at La Crelinette has been to grow better, not bigger. A fair bit bigger, though, is another farm project that Jean Martin coordinates, the Ferme des Quatre Temps, a 160-acre farm in Hemingford, Quebec, about 40 minutes south of Montreal. Its eight acres of intensive organic production are a pilot project financed by André Desmarais of international management and holding company Power Corporation, whose family is among the wealthiest in Canada and was worth an estimated $8.38 billion in 2018. This farm has 60 acres of rotating pasture for beef and chicken, 40 acres of wooded areas for pigs, and a production kitchen that makes charcuterie and sausages. The Quatre Temps stall at the Jean Talon Market on summer and fall weekends in Montreal is the one with a long lineup, since people order their vegetables by the unit online and pick up at the market or buy on site. It was also one of the most common Quebec farms to see on Locavore restaurant menus in Montreal. Now, Fortier is launching a magazine, which might seem like a funny thing for a farmer to do, but the biannual Growers & Co. magazine will tell the stories of cultivators, urban gardeners, farmers, chefs, and activists who all work for communities to benefit from sustainable, local, and equitable food supply chains. It's in French and English and is beautiful, but magazines aren't cheap, and I'm curious about whether the magazine is more like the Jell-O magazine of the early 1900s, a smart way to market a product, or in this case, local food via stories of farmers, rather than a way to sell a magazine. Here's Jean-Martin. Hi, Jean-Martin. It's so good to speak with you today. You have your sparkling water there. Yeah, I have my sparkling water, and uh, I'm so excited. It's our it's our happy hour drink. You said you won't drink uh, alcohol because it's a Monday. I, I guess you're you're working hard right now at the end of the harvest season. Well, uh, I am, uh, but uh, about the drinks, I I, I try to have Mondays kind of dry, uh, so that I can I can uh, go with the rest of the week and have some great drinks the rest of the time. <laughs> so that's 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 for that. All right. Well, then that leads me into a lightning round question. Um, what's your favorite fruit to eat straight from the tree, vine, or bush? Uh, grapes for sure. I have a pergola at home and we grow really nice grapes. Uh, some of them are seedless and you know, come September, they're all ripened. And, and when it gets even cooler, like the last nights, it's just, it's just the flavor really comes into them. So grapes, grapes, grapes. And I also have some banana trees in my house and once a year they give bananas. And so really? I, I, I get those little small bananas. That's, that's really cool also. What's the variety? Uh, I don't know. They're, they're chiquitas. They're like this big. The little and, baby uh, ones. Yeah, they're, the, they're kind of the, the, the ones that you can buy. You know, you can buy a banana trees uh, at different greenhouse suppliers. But the trick is to give them some heavy dose of potassium, like 0050, like totally not organic. But that just like gives them a shock and then they just produce the fruits. And that's the only way we can get fruits uh, in our climate. Okay, so even you, you will you will use non-organic in your own house to grow bananas. That's okay. Well, it's just if I want to get the fruits, it's like more of an epic thing. It's like, oh, we're getting fruits. Um, but it's yeah, pretty it's, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not the ultimate. Like I wouldn't, I my diet wouldn't be based around that. But you know, would that be the weirdest vegetable or fruit you've ever grown? That was the next light uh, round question. Bananas, yeah, for sure. Like we're growing. Uh, we also grow ginger here in the greenhouse oh fun yeah fresh ginger it's so beautiful it's so amazing and uh 
since I'm a market gardener, you know, you, you make a lot of money with it too. So that's oh, important yeah, actually. for me. Yeah, I saw that yeah. at Jean Talon. I was, I was really surprised because they look so clean there. And yeah. I was explaining to my friend why it's so unique. And she was like, why would I buy that? I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't no, understand how rare that is to find mm -hmm. it locally from Quebec. Yeah. Um, what's your uh, favorite fall meal? Phone meal? Fall meal, de l'automne. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I think like uh, potage uh, with uh, leek. Leek soup, okay. Leek and potatoes. Um, I really, nice. I really like that. It's like for me, it's like an all-time favorite, and a little fresh parsley on it. Mm. Mm. Especially on a gloomy day like today. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're at you're at your farm there. Are you at the Ferme des Quatre Temps or yeah, at, I'm at Jardin de la Crinette? I'm Ferme des Quatre Temps. We just uh, finished uh, the Monday. We had a meeting at the end of the day because I was announcing to the crew who was going to be on next year's crew. Because uh, we had, you know, we, 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 our hiring process finished last Friday and we met eight people. We had 70 resumes and we hired six. So wow. they, 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 the, our crew, or this year's crew got, got to meet some of them and they voiced their opinion about who they would choose. And then we made our choices and then we just announced it to the crew and they're excited. Okay, I'm going to skip the rest of the lightning round for now because I really want to ask you how unique that is. I don't know that many farms that are going through that kind of hiring process. Uh, you must get so many requests because are these people from all over? Are they from Quebec? How do they hear about you? Um, uh, there, there used to be more all over, but we've decided that you know we would run uh, the farm in French. And so in the past, we've had people from New Zealand and we've had people from in English speaking countries that came to the farm. And then obviously that meant that we would switch to English uh, most of the time when they were there. That, we decided that it was, that was getting kind of quite complicated. So for next year, we're doing it in French. So we had people apply from Quebec, from France, from Belgium. And we had one woman from Finland. But because they couldn't come here so that we would meet them, this next year it's going to be an all-Quebec uh, rookie team. So everybody's going to be from Quebec next year. Uh, but usually we have people from different countries, and we like that because this is like a big melting pot, and we like to have diversity in it. And um, yeah, it's a great opportunity for, for the young people that we hire here on the farm. They get a two-year internship with us. They work really hard. They have a lot of responsibilities. They really, they learn all there is to know about market gardening. And after two years, the goal is to have them be ready to start their own projects and as so, ready as yeah. possible. Yeah. And then by keeping it all Quebec, you're hoping, is it intentional that you want to have more Quebec farm projects because you are just hiring Quebecers? Well, it's just COVID. COVID makes it so that we, ah. it's hard. For, it's hard for French to people so to this travel. Is more and, practical issue, yeah, not a we want to support local. <laughs> yeah, this year was kind of different in in many ways, but uh, it still works. Yeah, that's great for for everybody who did get those jobs and a great opportunity for Quebecers. Okay, so then let's talk about uh, your big news that just happened. You're releasing mm. a magazine now, uh, yeah. Growers and Co. You got the branded hat there. Uh, why did you want to start a farming magazine? I know you've written for some, but why launch one? Uh, that's such a great question. Uh, I guess my last experiences in the last few years, you know, I did a TV show in French called Les Fermiers. And uh, there was a film crew that was here for two years. They, they filmed us in our environment and what we were doing. And then that was aired on, on TV. And it just got really... It got really popular and people really liked it and appreciated it. And, and for me, that made the click of when we portray uh, farmers, young farmers, ecological farmers in a really, in a bright way, in a, in, where the beauty comes out and when it's real, uh, people really dig it. And then they jump on board with, with what we're doing, which is, you know, feeding communities with local food. And so for me, the last three, four years, I've been thinking about how I can do instead of being me all the time featured, how I could be the one perhaps featuring other people that are doing amazing work. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to have a network of people around me that believe in my projects. And I pitched the idea of the magazine and the clothing brand to another group of people that were doing something similar in Quebec City. And uh, they agreed and we partnered. And then I worked for six months uh, on the magazine, making sure that each article is well-crafted, finding the people to write them, 
uh, finding the people to write about wasn't hard because my network is very large. Mm -hmm. But when people read the magazine, they will understand uh, small scale farming in, in a very positive light because there's a lot of very inspirational growers out there that are doing awesome work. And for me, I just wanted to, to put it out there. And what's the demographic where, and where is this going to be distributed? Um, this is all kind of in the, in the, in the play here, because this is the first launch. Uh, you can order it <clears throat> through the website. So growers.co, the magazine's there, you can order it there. And we have the official launch on the 30th of October. So in two weeks. And after that, we have different places where we want to distribute it, but we needed to have the first edition to kind of show it to them so that right. they would say, yes, I'm interested. So yeah. it's like the, uh, the egg or the chicken. We needed to do it before we would know where it would really go. Yeah. How do you sell um, a magazine when you don't have a magazine? Yet? Yeah. But I honest, honestly, I, I, people listening to this, if you could check it out, it is so beautiful. It's such a beautiful object. It's Rick. It's a uh, square and it's all recycled 100% post consumer paper but the quality of the images and the quality of the stories uh, make it a very inspirational uh, thing and for me the goal with that is that people uh, embark into this idea of having more and more people not so young and not so young people encouraging small farms right and you said you're working with uh quebec uh a Quebec agency or Quebec investors or a Quebec company of some kind? Yeah, the, these are guys, they're, they're, uh, they're a company called Uke, so H-O-O-K-E, and they have a fly fishing brand. It's really popular and a hunting also uh, brand, for both of them. So they're in that space and they had a TV show that aired just after mine on oh, UniTV. Okay. And they had a magazine and they had a floating company and they had amazing branding and great storytelling. And I was, I was looking at what they were doing and I was like, geez, this is exactly what I, because I've been planning Growers & Co. for like seven years. Okay. This, is, this project has been a long time in my mind. I, I, I visited the Patagonia headquarters in California twice to pitch them the idea of featuring small scale farmers and having, you know, a clothing line dedicated to our craft and, I just did a lot, so much work to get other people involved and it kind of never worked out, never worked out. And then eventually I just think, you know, I, I think I'm going to do it myself. And then it was, is, was when I met these guys and what they were doing, I was like, wow, this is exactly how I want to do things. And so I approached them and I proposed yeah, to them right. to become partner and they agreed. And then we just kind of got married and then we've been kind of <laughs> working out marriage details ever since right and how much is this about making money with the magazine how much is it about getting the stories across uh I, no i don't think i don't think the money uh, the magazine is going to make uh, a lot of money um it's mostly about sharing the story in in the way i see has an impact and um the 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 clothing line the clothing collection and the tools supports the magazine and eventually a lot of the videos that we want to make on other farmers. So it kind of works together, uh, but I needed to have an engine that would sustain, you know, the work that we do. And for that, it's mostly the cloning plan yeah. that, that, that will pay for, for the work that we do with the magazine and for the videos that are also coming up. Why did you decide to sell quality shirts on the magazine website instead of like vegetable boxes or subscriptions or something food related? Uh, great question. Like for me, that just like I've been a tool advisor for different companies for many years. And so the, part of what we do with growers is a, a tool section where I handcraft some tools to my likings and designs here in Quebec. And the goal with those tools is to have them across uh, Quebec and Canada for home gardeners and, and, and market gardeners. But the clothing aspect was something that, you know, we all wear clothes. I wear clothes to work every day. And it's never, so. to, yeah. <laughs> it's, never, it's never tailored That's to... It's never tailored to... That's part of needs. the internship. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Too you, much. you need to have your pants. You need to have pants <laughs> to come to the farm. But, uh, you know, it's just... For me, like having um, jeans with knee pads makes a big difference in my quality of work. Having jackets with pockets so that I can put my tools in them. 
So, you know, anytime I go to Europe, I see what they had there. And I was like, wow, this is so amazing. I like to have that here. And that was the start of my reflection about clothing. And uh, it's also, it's just like finding a clothing company that shares your values. Right. Uh, I just think there's that. And there's the other thing is like, you know, when you're a farmer, you probably don't go shopping all the time. You know, that's not your thing. But when you put your jacket to, to go to, you know, the hardware store, it's a nice jacket and it fits you well. There's like prideness in it and it's a grower's jacket and it represents who you are and your value. I just thought that there was something kind of like really cool about that, you know, about mm-hmm. giving some pride with what you're wearing to the people that are doing the work. So that was it. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your two farm projects because you have the, the Jardin de la Crelinette and then you have the Ferme des Quatre Temps. Are you full time at the Ferme des Quatre Temps or do you still work at the Crelinette? No, la Crelinette, Modelaine, my wife, runs it without me. And, and the famous joke is that ever since I've left the farm, she, she's, she's, she thinks it's been, it's, it's been an up, upswing ride. She likes it. <laughs> she's the boss and she gets to manage it according to her liking. Okay. And FQT Farm, Ferme Quatre Temps, this is uh, our fifth, fifth year, I think. So already, and I commute to, to work. I come from one farm to another every day. And uh, it's, a, it's a very different project here because it's not just a farm. It's also a teaching ground. We do mm-hmm. a lot of experiments on different things. And um, there's an animal component to the farm. Yeah. So, and you preserve a lot, of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of what you make. Yeah, there's a grow. commercial kitchen. We do sausages and it's just, it's just a, it's more of a complete farm in a way, if I can say that. Yeah. Holistic Um, and yeah, yeah. everything together. There's, there's close to 20 people now working on this farm. So it's a, it's a very big project. It's almost doubled since a number of years ago, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, the animals and the kitchen and in the veggies were 11 plus me, plus, you know, there's Chloe that runs, supervises the whole operation. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's growing and it's, it's fun. It's a great project. I'm so proud and happy to be with this project. You know, when we started it at first, there was one part of the farming community that kind of was, they were kind of naysayers and saying, oh, it's like, it's like farm that's like fully paid and it has a lot of means and it's, and I was kind of worried at the start because my intentions were, you know, quite, quite good by doing this. I just thought that we would train farmers and then we would feed more people and go to places that perhaps other growers weren't going. And I think five years later, I think we've proved that this farm did a lot of good to uh, the culture of farming in Quebec and yeah. happy with that. And if you're passing on that learning to, to other farmers, obviously they're going to start their businesses and they're not going to have that financial backing that you did originally. Is that part of your, your teaching and how to actually do that themselves? <clears throat> no, that, it's funny you ask. That's the part that they kind of need to figure out on themselves. Yeah. We, we really focus on, how to really become a good uh, farm worker. So learning all the little things, how to be efficient with your steps, with your movements, which tool to use, Mm -hmm. how to manage different crops, but also how to manage a crew. And so my, my interns, they come for two years. The first year they're like farm workers and they're managed and supervised by the second year. And I work with the second years to help them learn how to manage people, how to deal un- with uncertainty, how to deal with stress, mm. how to you know plan a week out, how to conduct uh, mm. you know all of the work that needs to be done here. And so after two years, they're they're really handy, they're really good with all the operations, but they, they also have a skill set in managing others, right. which uh, which I think is an essential essential part of farming also. And they'll hopefully go on to sell very um, effect- efficiently and grow very efficiently as well. What are the best ways for farms to sell their produce and products right now and make money? Like, I mean, restaurants are off the table for a mm-hmm. lot of places. I mean, you can still they're still selling through takeout and other things, but it's not as big as it was before, I imagine. Yeah, that's that's very sad. We, you know, I don't think we need to talk about that, but that's the biggest bummer of, of, of 2020. Yeah. Let's talk uh, about our, the upside. Like what are the opportunities? <laughs> yeah. Now? Well, what, what happened is that CSA, you know, community supported agriculture really went skyrocketed in the spring because there was, there was a real menace that because the borders were cl- closing, 
that, you know, there would be a shortage of food. Right. And so that the grocery store wouldn't be, you know, filled yeah. with, with veggies. And so a People lot of freaked out and got their CSA baskets. And so most uh, organic farms were sold out by April. That's awesome. And most of them took many, many more clients that they were used to. So it was a big, big positive hit for the small scale farming community and farmers market were okay in most places. You know, it was a bit slower because of the, you know, the, the distantiation that we had to go through and all the different new things that we needed to put into practice. But farmers markets went really well. CSA was off the chart. Restaurants didn't go well. But I think also some growers turned to different niches that weren't really, uh, you know, like here we do uh, orders. People make orders and then we deliver. So just like what the restaurants are doing, uh, it's kind of a takeout from the farm. And so we've developed a website that helps do that. And then we deliver at Jean Talon, but it's pre-order in a box. You yeah. got to choose everything you want. Yeah. So, so I, have, I have to tell you a little story about that. Uh, my friend is probably going to be upset that I'm telling you this story, but um, I, I go to Jean Talon all the time. I, I love that market and she orders from you um, and to pick up. So we coordinate our, our trips to to align with her pickups. And there's always a line. There's always yeah, a line for your stall. And it's not, like other stalls, they aren't. And I mean, people aren't ordering online for the other stalls. So that makes sense because people are going there just on the Saturday and Sunday when you're there to pick up their orders. And then you have a beautiful selection. And for some reason, your vegetables always look better. Uh, I don't know if it's that you're, you know, making that part of your marketing, uh, if that's intentional to, to make yourself stand out in a way, because I feel like you have a full business model um, for for everything that you do. And it's those little details that make the difference. This is not my story, but do you So agree? that's that's the positive <laughs> part of your story. And now I want to hear what, what's the not so positive aspect of that story. Well, it, it's it's not a not so positive. It's just I would never ask this in a in a traditional interview. But we got into the habit of going every week to see mm -hmm. what people were working at your stall because every yep. week there were different people there and they were all very young and they yep. were all very attractive and, and they were all very strong and they were all very friendly. Uh, and and I, I didn't know if that was part of your, your choice. Every weekend, are you like, okay, you get to go and you get to go and you get to go or you need to take a shower or... Or what do you do? It's a great question. And, and the truth is that these are all people in the fields. So these are the workers that we have with us during the week. And then we have a schedule where some of them are off either Saturday or Sunday. And we want them to have a weekend off, like two days, at least once a month. And so there's a rotation of always different people doing Saturday, different people doing Sunday. And this year we had two staff that were kind of not farm people that would just come to farmer's market to help alleviate the workload. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, to be honest, like, I think they're, I think they're beautiful and I think they're friendly and they're nice because they're passionate about what we do here and they're in the fields working so hard every week. And when they go to farmer's market, it's kind of like they're in a way it's, it's their pay because their prideness is there and they're, they're really committed to it. So it's, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that actually. So I think <laughs> that's, the, really, that's the plan. That's the it, plan. Yeah. And it, it is a beautiful setup. It just feels like, I don't know if it feels like there's a little more money or if there's a little more intention or, or what it is behind it, but yeah, it, it just I, looks I, I nice. Wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's the money because, you know, they're paid 14, 50 an hour. And, uh, you know, we have nice, uh, you know, installations here for sure, but, it's that's what I teach. I teach best practice of how to do things. Mm -hmm. and I teach an online master class about this and it's in six, 65 countries. And, you know, I have somewhat of a reputation about being a very knowledgeable grower. And that is reflected on how I train my staff to grow. And so the vegetables that we bring at market, they're nice because, you know, we're good growers. And, yeah. and, and that's that's pretty much it. And And the staff is is happy because we take care of them during the week. We have different ways to make sure that everybody's on board with the program, check-ins and, and giving roles and responsibility, empowering them. There, there's all sorts of things that we do that are not related to money, but just with how, you know, we run the farm here. Yeah. And um, so that's, that's, that's that. 
do you think every farm should be preserving its own harvest? Because maybe those ugly things you you don't want to sell or they don't sell as well. Like, <coughs> what should farms be doing if they they want to make more money that way? Um, there's different ways to go about it. What we do here is that we bring the leftovers to the commercial kitchen, and so th that's how you know we do a lot of the produce that are transformed. Yeah. Um, do you think a farm you know, needs to do that though, like, it, or if they don't no, have waste? Or? No, because you know, on my my home farm at La Grenette, we don't have that, and it's when you're tight with your planning, you know, you usually end up not being, you know, with too much. And mm. the other thing is that we know what we're going to sell pretty much from week to week. So we don't harvest what we're not going to sell. So if the worst is that we leave it in the field, that's the worst. But when we pick it, there's, there's labor and there's cost to that. So we need to make sure that we're going to sell it. So mm -hmm. we're pretty good on evaluating. And if you go to Jean Talon at two o'clock, three o'clock, usually we'll, there's not that much left. Oh no, you're sold out. You're not getting that ginger by the end of the day for sure. No, and your tomatoes, gosh, yeah. no, you're not getting any nice tomatoes by then. Um, what's behind you there in your fields? Can you describe? Uh, yeah, this, is this audio and video. So you yeah, need some. so this is the tomato greenhouse that we pulled out today. So you see how the fields there, they're being brought forth. And then we're planting winter greens and winter greens. So this is <clears throat> this is kale here that's going to grow all the winter long with uh, some green onions, more kale, and then we have uh, greens, arugula that's growing. And mm -hmm. this, as of today, the greenhouse is not heated anymore. So these oh, will really? grow, <clears throat> they'll grow without heat, and we'll do a couple of harvests before Christmas, and then it'll go, it's going to grow in January, February. This is winter farming. And we're really specialized in that. And how, yeah, uh, how do you not um, get a cold freeze there? Is it that it's so big? There's <clears throat> enough air in there being heated well, up? Well, you get a, you get you get frost inside. Uh, what happens is that we slowly. Uh, that's a, such a tough word for me. It's a, a clim, a, acclimatize. Yeah, it's such a tough word. Acclimatize. But we acclimatize yeah. the veggies to colder, cooler, colder, cooler, colder, cooler. And we choose these varieties because they can take a hard frost. Mm -hmm. And because they'll unthaw the next day, uh, they'll be good to, they'll, they'll survive. What's your and variety so, of kale there, by the way? Uh, Toscano yep. is, okay. and, and winter boar. These are the winter two that boar. we use. And um, so, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of strategies. And at night when it's below frost in the greenhouse, we have blankets to cover uh, the veggies with. And so, yeah, it's more work, but we have fresh greens in the winter. And uh, then we have storage crops that are in the cold room. And then we go on and do CSA or we, do, we, went, we did restaurants the new, years back uh, where we had fresh greens and root vegetables every week. Uh, and we just keep on delivering. That's great. That's yeah. so exciting that we really can go all year. Like my community garden, it's closing officially at the end of October, but you can keep winter um, winter produce going. And you can the only thing you need is, is, is a greenhouse, a plastic greenhouse, because what is really detrimental to the crop is the wind. Mm. And the cold blowing wind on the crop is really what uh, makes kills them. Mm. But if you have somewhat of a shelter and, you know, the plastic, uh, lets the sunlight true and if it's really uh, sunny outside it's going to be like 35 degrees here and mm -hmm. then they just they grow and then if they're acclimatized then you're good for the nights and so there's more to it than that yeah but it works <laughs> and we've been kind of figuring this out for the last five years yeah. and uh, we've had you know great success I have a gardening sheet, which uh, I find pretty helpful, but it, it kind of blows off and blows away. But I remember there was a frost warning once and my mom went out and bought um, like blankets from the store. She didn't have anything. That was her like, oh, I need to save the trees. This is what I need to yeah. do. And she just covered them in in blankets that I think were like um, like Snoopy or something. They were the only blankets that were cheap wherever she went and she just needed an emergency and so we had snoopy blankets covering the trees at home that was back in the day my mom will be very embarrassed i'm telling you what was that too, a, fi but, a fig tree uh it was an orange tree but she was in arizona yeah. at the time yeah well that's what you need to do like if yeah. you want to keep it you need to protect it
Yeah, that was precious. Um, mm. Okay, so I, I want to talk a little bit about um, a survey from the Laboratory of Analytical Sciences and Agri-Food at Dalhousie University. They do a lot of really cool research out there about agriculture. And they recently revealed that 67% of new gardeners say the pandemic influenced their decision to start growing food at home. Um, we don't have data on how many of those people actually had success or how many will garden again next year uh, or start some container herbs or buy some grow lights or uh, some kind of greenhouse setup to keep their green thumbs going through the winter. But what do you think? But do you think gardening is cool now and here to stay? Mm. Or is this just a COVID blip where people were freaking no. out? It was it was cool. You know, I wrote a book in French a year ago with Marie-Claude Lortier and we were we were claiming there that, you know, for, uh, gardening is the new yoga. It's like people are into it and they should be because there's a lot of benefits to gardening, not just that you're, you know, self-sufficient and you're producing quality food that you're eating, but it, there's also something very therapeutic in it. And mm. there's a lot of colors and there's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a process where you're growing stuff. You know, you can see the result of what you're, the energy you're putting into it. So no, I think, mm. I think that's a trend that is going to keep on going. I think that the more and more people become aware of how, you know, disastrous for our health industrial farming is. And most of the food that we have in the grocery stores are not healthy for us. So the more people kind of realize that, they're like, yeah, I'll just take the matters in my own hand. And so I think that trend is going to be, uh, it's going to be for, for some time. And I do think that most people that started garden this year's, they probably make a lot of mistakes and they probably didn't succeed in everything, but now they have like six months to really prepare and then start fresh with new ideas and new tools. You know, Growers is presenting a lot of the tools that we use professionally, but are, they are scaled and tailored for home gardeners. Mm -hmm. and, and we also show them, show them and with videos how to use the tools mm -hmm. to not break your back and, you know, not weed on your knees. Right. The, uh, so, that, was a, so, that was a great uh, magazine plug. Um, I'm wondering if you have another best tip for new gardeners. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Best tip, hmm. uh, I would I would stick with uh, do like the pro, like that's the best way because there's there's many ways to garden. You know you can home garden many different ways, but you know the spacings for the crop, getting good seeds also I think that's important. You want to be getting seeds that ideally are being grown here in Quebec, uh, like and that are. Like those ones? Uh, or... But Ecosile, they certify, they certify that the seeds are organic. But like right. Ferme Tournesol, yes. they, they have a great seed collection and they're all breeded here. So they're adapted to our climate. I think that helps a lot. Uh, working with, you know, really good compost and just like kind of having row covers and insect nets. So oh. these row covers are like blankets that you'll put at night and that will, you know, act as a greenhouse effect and insect nets uh is is how you protect your crops against pests and um so what about squirrels a lot of people have trouble with squirrels yeah did you I big think, cages yeah or insect net you cover your crop with insect net and uh, okay. that's it they can't go in and when you say that there's not a lot of healthy food at a grocery store do you mean the packaged food or do you mean the fruits and vegetables or all of it uh in my opinion uh, i would say fruits and vegetables okay and so why do you yeah. say that well, because when you understand how this food is grown and where, in what condition, you're like, wow, you know, so most of the vegetable. Like... Sorry, go ahead. Indust industrial farms, mm -hmm. most of the, the produce that, especially fruits or whatever that are found in our shelves, you know, they're grown on, on giga, giga farms, mega farms, uh, a lot of pesticides, a lot of herbicides, uh, migrant workers not always working in the best conditions. And, you know, the watersheds are polluted for sure. The uh, soil health is being mined for sure. There's a lot of impact, negative impact with industrial farming. And because we don't see it, we don't relate to it. But, yeah. you know, when you are a farmer like me and you know how these crops are grown and where they're grown, there's an impact of flying, you know, peppers from Holland or flying peppers from from Mexico, there's a cost to that. Yeah. Uh, then you start to think about the impact of what you're buying. Mm. And, and I then, know it's not pleasant for a lot of people to hear because they're like, they'd like to imagine that it's all good. 
but it's not. It's not all good, and, uh, but there's alternatives, and small-scale farmers are the alternatives in many ways. What, what, what do you say to people who say uh, buying organic and local is too expensive? Um, you know, that's a question that I, I get asked a lot. I, I kind of sure. disagree with that. I think that uh, organic, local organic, uh, when people pay the price, they're paying the, the good price, the right price that, you know, pays for what it's worth. And I think that inversely, when we're buying com- conventional vegetables at the grocery stores, you are not paying for all the external costs with pollution, with land degradation, with social justice, all of these really important things that are not being reflected in the low price. And so cheap food comes at a cost. And I think that that's one of the mission that I have, not to paint a gloomy portrait of the industrial food system, but to really show people that when they buy something that's local, that comes from a small farm, the impact of that money is really tremendous. So there's, there's really, uh, you know, your money is, is invested in something that makes sense. So if you look at the value, that's different than just talking about the cost. And I don't want to sound too nerdy with this, but for me, these, these, these questions are really important to not just about talk about the cost because, you know, if, if the cost was the only thing we would all, you know, drink cheap wine and, but you know we recognize that certain winemakers make a better product and we want to pay more for that and we appreciate it more and this should apply to vegetables it should apply to bread making it should apply to the meats that we eat it should apply to everything we could go down a wine rabbit hole about quality wine and what that means in price versus uh farming practices because it's it's all um a, a, a big issue, but I was going to ask you in the, the last question for the lightning round question was actually going to be, what's your best tip for monocrop farmers? So I don't know if that's just like change your ways or if there's something more specific you could offer. It's just like good luck. You know, climate change is, is climate change is going to hit and it's mm-hmm. already hitting. And, yeah. you know, if you're not diversified and if you're not, uh, you know, multi enterprise and doing things very, if you, you can't maneuver, yeah. It's going to be hard to keep going because the climate change scenario is not just like a gloomy thing. It's yeah. that this year was record low rain in Quebec. I've never seen anything like it. The pond where we, we've been pumping water out of the pond for 15 years, it was completely dry. We had to dig it twice as big. And so that's just this year. And so mm-hmm. what is it going to be next year and two years from now and three years from now? So you know, small farms are resilient. They can adapt. They can change their systems. They can put more water. They, they use, uh, you know, energy and water much more efficiently. Uh, I wouldn't put my money on big farms for the yeah. future. Well, what can a monocrop farm, like a massive giga farm, like you say, do? How can they transition? It's, it feels like it's such a sunk cost at a certain point. Like, how do they adapt to, to being in, in a more sustainable um, way of managing themselves <laughs> your your face says it all you're like a little bit of a smile but it's like well it's like I, you know, i'm rooting for the small farms and I, I have a lot of options for them to get big, better and but for the big farms for me like this might be you know for some people they they might be sign I, it's like okay you, you know you're 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 being a, a jackass here but for me it's like big big farms industrial farms monoculture farms they're a big part of the environmental degradation and the, the loss of biodiversity and the, the lack of interest for young people in, to get into farming was a big part because farms are so streamlined and so industrialized that the work is not interesting anymore. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm the last person on earth who wants to kind of help them or defend them. I'm going to wish them luck and I, I sincerely hope that they, they make it out alive and that they're in the end happy and whatever, but I, I'm not rooting for that system. Okay. And then we're seeing a few more things in, in trends in farming, um, uh, uh, more than people coming on board to gardening and farming during the pandemic. Uh, one of the bu- buzziest terms that I've heard in the last year is regenerative yeah. agriculture, and especially when it relates to meat and cattle farming. So mm-hmm. what is that in your own words? Uh, regenerative agriculture is because we are facing climate change again, and 
Regenerative agriculture plays different role, but it's kind of a next step because we had sustainable agriculture. So you had uh, degradation farming, which is conventional farming. So we're depleting the soil, we're mining it, we're making it weaker, weaker, weaker every uh, year so that we need to put more fertilizers. And that's the gimmick that, that the, uh, the big industry made money with for all these years. And so you had sustainable farming, which was kind of just making sure that the way you're growing would just keep on going. And then regenerative is that we're also making the soil better. We're sequestering carbon by growing grasses, by using no-till methods of, of, of farming and gardening. So it's, a, it's kind of an upper echelon of best practice. And uh, it's a buzzword in California, in the US a lot. There's Kiss the Ground, the movie that came out that really tells the story. And there's going to be more, more, more and more films and books coming out about it. But what it means is that we are using farming, uh, alternative farming systems to mitigate climate change. And with animals, that's really possible when they're grass fed and that when they're, um, they're pastured. Pastured grass fed beef it has a positive impact on the environment. That's really interesting in terms of the carbon um, output versus carbon input. How, yeah. how is that measured? Uh, scientifically, like grass, when it grows, uh, sequesters more carbon than trees. So, and when you have a herbivore that comes, a cow, a cow that comes and uh, chews the grass, it, it gives a signal to the grass to grow more roots, to regrow, and then it, it takes carbon to do that. Now, actually, when people mow the lawn, that's also good for, for carbon. Uh, so that's, that's another way to look at it. But, uh, you know, we want to have herbivores. And then when you move your herd, when you move the cows, they also fertilize different, different grounds. And so there's a whole science to it. Uh, it's very interesting. But with, with uh, animals is one thing. With vegetables, it's more complicated. But with grains also, it's all about the no-till revolution. So not plowing and now not putting metal into the ground because when we do that we're bringing a lot of oxygen into the ground and we're we're sequestering we're releasing carbon into the atmosphere so not putting metal when are we when are farms we're putting metal into, into when, the ground? when they're plowing oh when they're plowing okay you know when when you see the big big tractors in their field and they're plowing and they're overhauling the soil that mm -hmm. releases a lot of carbon into the atmosphere uh, that can be measured and it's not because you know regenerative Farming is really new. Uh, we have some people that are really cutting edge in, in Quebec, uh, Regenerative Canada. They're doing awesome work. They're just kind of educating people, policymakers, people in government yeah. about the importance of that. But it's, uh, as you say, it's an up and coming trend. And, uh, and it's a dangerous one in, in a sense too, because anytime you have a buzzword, it can be used maybe in a negative way or by someone who doesn't really understand it, who isn't practicing it exactly the same way, like biodynamics, for example. How yeah. many people misunderstood biodynamics or had a different interpretation of that? So I worry with regenerative agriculture, is everybody actually doing it correctly or the best that can be done? I think that this word, if we're implying, you know, farming practices, it's a, it's a map. You know, we're going in direction, we're trying to improve, we're heading, we're steering towards, but it's never an end game because, you know, regenerative farming, it was done in the past. If you, if you, if, if, you know, people were in, in China or in India, uh, pre-colonialism in the, in the 1910 and 1920, they had been farming for the same way for thousands and thousands of years with never depleting the soil, always making it better. And so we have a history of knowing how to do this, but now we need to reinvent because of chemical farming, the damage that it done, uh, that it that it did. It's kind of a it's kind of a necessary mean. We need to change agriculture, and we need to regenerate the soil because we've destroyed it. It's and I know the devil's advocate simple. argument would be that we need more space and more land if we want to produce in this way on a large scale do you think mm. that what do you think about that argument well that's that's somewhat true you know if if all the if, if all the meat that was eaten in canada or quebec needed to be grass-fed we, we wouldn't have enough land you know there's a movie called C cowspiracy that kind of explains that but you know that comes hand in hand with if you want to be regenerative 
people, if you want to have a regenerative mindset, then we need to eat meat, not every day, and make it something special and really reduce the meat consumption that we have in our society. And, and, and you and I are not even talking about factory meat, which is, in my opinion, one of the worst thing that ha humans have ever done on planet Earth. It's factory farms. It's just like completely terrible. But we don't need to go there if you don't want to. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. I only have yeah. time for one more question, unfortunately, and now I want to have a whole other conversation with you about, about factory farming. Um, but I, I, I do want to talk about food hubs because I think there's mm. been a lot of coverage of factory farming. There hasn't been as much coverage of food hubs, and it was a big thing at Seattle, Canada, the big food event that happen, happens every year and like all the products that are coming out every year, and they had an entire discussion about it. So that means to me that it's hitting more of the mainstream. Um, so I'm wondering um, how much you're involved with or know about food hubs and initiatives that are happening in Quebec and if you'd ever consider that for your farms and if you can um, explain a little bit for anybody who doesn't know what a food hub is. Yeah, I, I'm not the expert with that. I don't follow that, what's ha what's going on because we, we sell directly uh, at, on both the farms I work at. So at, at, we, we're at Jean Talon, restaurants. And food hubs are when, you know, farmers get together to kind of deliver at one place and then it's either distributed elsewhere or it's sold there. So there's there's kind of a it's kind of a communal way of, of organizing distribution where most, most often the farmers are either um, in, in a co-op or, you know, they have a say in how things are run. Uh, I think there's a bright future for that. And I think it, it also creates spots where people can have access to local foods, which is the other things like grocery stores are there, but they're not, they're not responding to the demand of, you know, sourcing locally, they're, they, they're totally not. They're not on board with that program. And so the alternative is, is food hubs in many shapes or way. Um, and, you know, gladly there's people that are making the commitment to develop those, to support those, to make them known. And, you know, these people are helping farmers more than anybody else. These are the real heroes that are supporting farmers, activists that are putting these on, business people that are helping. and. You know, obviously, the people that are eating this food is also all part of the solution. Okay. Well, that's all I have time for, but I did actually just want to, I, I meant to finish the lightning round, so maybe I'll just ask you, what are you having for dinner tonight? It seems like you eat so well. Uh, what am I having for dinner tonight? Yeah. Well, there was, there was we made a big pot of risotto last, yeah, mm. last year was Sunday. We did a big pot of that, and we're probably going to get some kale here and just chop it up nutritional yeast and that's gonna be it i think that would be a nice meal wonderful thank you yeah. so so much for your time i really appreciate it and good luck with your magazine i'll put up all the links for it i would really appreciate it if you would read it and uh write back to me what you think about it since the first sure. edition i'm really uh hoping for feedback if people like it where they'd like to see that coming I, we're super open okay and, how do people uh, get in touch what's the best way for people to give you that feedback if they don't have oh, your email like I do. Yeah, I think I think on the website, but you have my email, I so do. you can yeah. send me your feedback directly. I'll send I you a copy. That. It just came out of the print today, so tomorrow I'm okay. going to see it for the first time. Uh, congratulations. I would cheers you if we had something that wasn't water, but that's bad luck, so I don't think we should, and I want you to do really well with this project. Let's do it again. Wow, I'm really sorry. That got really dark there. You're probably wondering, where did Amy go? There's there's a funny voice coming out of nowhere. Although, if you're listening to the audio version of this, you were not wondering that at all. And it didn't bother you at all. If you were watching the video, you were probably now switching to the audio version of this podcast. Except that I put up fun visuals like pictures from Jean Martin's new magazine, which you can only see in the video-only version. Or you can just order the magazine yourself and check it out there. I'm also really happy that we had a non-alcoholic drink today because you can tell that I'm just a little bit hyper even if I'm completely sober. And if you want to listen to more episodes of this podcast, you can do that on iTunes, on Vimeo, on, oh, we got rid of video, Vimeo, on YouTube, on Spotify, on Stitcher, on Pocket Casts, and on Google Podcasts for all the contacts for the places that we mentioned or you can find them in the show notes wherever you got this podcast. Uh, you can also find it at my blog, multiculturiosity.com. Uh, that's a mouthful, multiculturiosity.com. And I will be back next week with another interview. We've got a really fun season lined up for you. Thanks for listening.